This is Winchester Academy. Coming to Winchester Academy on a cold Monday night. Uh, I appreciate your coming. I'm Terry Hankey. I'm uh, on the board and also chair of the program committee. And it's the programs committee's job to make sure we have an excellent speaker and an excellent topic. And we've done that for you tonight, I think. But first, uh, my job is to uh, have some. Uh, is that better? Closer. Uh, have have some announcements to make. Uh, thank you to Vanal Van Bentham for the coffee and cookies tonight. Uh, give her a big hand. A reminder to turn off uh, cell phones and digital devices that might interrupt our talk. Um, if you're not on our mailing list already, uh, we have sign-up cards over on the side. And uh, we also have comment cards if you'd like to tell us what you think about tonight's talk. The library's film series uh, for this next several weeks is built on the theme Strangers in Our Midst. And this Thursday, the 28th, the film will be In the Heat of the Night with Rod Steiger and Sidney Poitier. The film starts at 1.30 with introductory remarks by Jack Rhodes. And those are always informative and entertaining, and uh, I, I hope you can come. That's Thursday. What did I say? I'm sorry. It's Thursday, February 28th. And tomorrow night is uh, the library here is hosting a community panel discussion on depression and addiction. That starts at 6 o'clock. And uh, our next program is in two weeks, so we skip next week, but the, the following week, March 11th, Patrick Woods will present on the role of newspapers and digital media in small communities. And uh, tonight's program is sponsored by Carol Elvery and Bruce Inkman, and uh, we'd like to thank them. I'm just about ready to introduce our speaker, but a quick reminder, we'd like you to save your comments till after the talk, and we will pass microphones or this around in the audience. And uh, so we can, uh, we're recording this. It will be on the city uh, TV channel and eventually soon on YouTube. So uh, you've got lots of resources to refer your friends to. And also a reminder that a, uh, after the talk, we will get the questions and answers, and then we will need some help in those of you who are able in stacking the chairs on these little trolleys. And uh, the library's going to kick us out at 8 o'clock, so we got to hustle. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Sachin Chetta. And he ta taught me how to pronounce it. He's such an interesting speaker. I changed it a little bit. Perfect. And cheddar is like the cheese you put on your apple pie in Boston. Okay. Chetta is the director of the Fair Elections Project. This is a nonpartisan campaign. And uh, so don't expect to be pro-right or pro-left or up or down. Uh, we're going to hear the facts about what's going on with gerrymandering, uh, especially in Wisconsin. Now, there was uh, a legal action taken and uh, to challenge Wisconsin's legislative district maps and uh, to end map rigging and political gerrymandering in Wisconsin. A three-judge panel we'll probably hear more detail about this, uh, decided 
that's a U.S. district court um, decided in favor of the motion, but uh, the case then went to the U.S. Supreme Court and continues there. It's got to take a extra step in federal courts about April of this year. So there's lots of really hot news coming up on this topic. So um, I found out from Chetta that he is a, from a family of six, three children, one dog, and a wife, who is from Wisconsin, by the way. And uh, his... Uh, Training was mainly at UW-Milwaukee, but he spent some time at UW-Madison as well. So uh, he comes well qualified, and uh, I enjoyed talking to him over dinner. And I w am proud to introduce you to Cheddar. <laughs> Sachin Cheddar. Thanks, Terry. Don't leave me hanging. Oh, thanks. How's everybody doing? Thanks so much for coming out on a cold night, icy roads. There's this thing where this, there's the height of this is like if I stand in the middle, I just get blinded. So if at some point I just look like I'm blinking at you, it's because I stood in the middle. I'll try to go from right to left, left to right. Um, it's a great honor to be uh, a lecturer at the Winchester Academy. Uh, I have a, a project that I work on nationally, and I was on a call this afternoon. And they said, where are you driving to? Because I was driving, and they could see I was driving. I had a video call going while I was driving. And uh, I said, I'm speaking at the Winchester Academy this evening, <laughs> delivering the lecture. I think it's great. I think it's, it's, it's a phenomenal program you do here in uh, Wapaka. Can everybody hear me? I can't. I would tell with the microphone. So my goal today is to kind of tell you a little bit of a story about what's happening in Wisconsin. Um, and the most important thing that I want you to take away from this, I'm going to go through a lot of stuff, um, is uh, people really can make change. That's an important thing to remember, that power in America uh, is and should be uh, derived from the people. Uh, and uh, that today our politics are broken in Wisconsin. I'll, I'll try to make the case that our politics are broken. But there's a way to fix our politics and restore kind of the traditions of Wisconsin that I think made our state great. Um, I also, I want to I wanna put some nuance on something that Terry said. Um, I am personally a partisan. I'm a left-wing Democrat. The campaign is nonpartisan, and we are partnered with people from all across the political spectrum. Our co-chairs are uh, former Senator Dale Schultz, who was a Republican majority leader of the state Senate, and Tim Cullen, who was a former Democratic uh, uh, majority leader of the state senate, so one Republican and one Democrat. Uh, the third member of our leadership team is former state senator Dan Thino, uh, who was a Republican from northern Wisconsin. He represented Ashland uh, in the state senate. And um, w they've all come together around the idea that uh, despite people's different political and di different and divergent political views, that Wisconsin's long tradition had been to find a way to work together in community uh, to find areas where we could agree um, and to move the state forward to be uh, a progressive champion. And I don't mean progressive in, in left, but progressive in that we would make progress. And things like uh, having the first kindergarten or uh, civil rights being extended to more people in Wisconsin or you know, investing in an uh, in institution of higher education and in public schools. These were bipartisan decisions, a strong road and infrastructure system. These were bipartisan decisions that this uh, state made for a long time. And we found a way to compromise, even when politics seemed at its most intense. And that's changed radically in the last decade. Um, and I'd like to put some, some, some uh, work into talking about why I think it's changed. And so ho hopefully you'll be persuaded. And if not, you'll tell me I'm wrong in questions, and we'll all uh, retire to the tavern to discuss it for hours on end, <laughs> as we do in Wisconsin. Um, so let me set the stage. Uh, and. Uh, again, I, I, I want, uh, I'll challenge especially those who are more conservative, those who identify as Republican or conservative in the audience, to hold my feet to the fire if you think things that I say are not fair. Um, because in Wisconsin, um, the, the purveyors of gerrymandering, the ones who have done what we think is wrong, have been the ones in power since 2010, and those have been Republicans. Now, other states have seen this challenge, 
uh, from Democrats, whether you look at Massachusetts or Maryland, there's a case from Maryland going to the Supreme Court, Illinois, our neighboring state, it is Democrats who rig the map. So I'm not trying to pick on Republicans as map riggers exclusively, although in Wisconsin it is Republicans who have been the map riggers, right? And so I want to talk about that. So let me start with uh, a tale of two elections. So in 2010, we had a wave election, and in fact it was a wave election that was probably the third or fourth wave election, third, let's call it the third wave election in a row. And what we mean by a wave election is that it kind of clearly tilted a lot of races in one direction. So in 2006, George W. Bush had been the president for six years. Democrats won a lot of things around the country. They took control of the Congress. They picked up eight seats in the state assembly and took the state Senate. Uh, 2008, the Democrats had another big strong year. Barack Obama won a big election. Democrats still had control of both houses of Congress. They ended up with uh, control of both houses of the Wisconsin State Legislature. And then there was a reaction, which is kind of normal, right? That like one party goes up and then the people in the middle say, well, let's rein them back a little bit. Some of that is prospective. Some of that is reactive to what's happened. Um, but in 2010, what is important as a starting point for our story is that Republicans won. They won almost every statewide office. They beat an 18-year incumbent U.S. Senator when Ron Johnson beat Russ Feingold. Um, and they won about 250,000 more votes in the aggregate in the State Assembly. The State Assembly has 99 seats. Um, and if you added up the results in all of them, the Republicans won pretty significantly. Because they won pretty significantly, they got about 60% of the seats. They got about 54 or 55% of the vote and they got 60% of seats. That was a rational result. The Democrats got 39 seats. Um, let me back up. So, so we think that that's what happens when a party wins an election, right? They get, they get more votes, so they get more seats. And I want people to really remember those two words, votes and seats, right? Because that you get votes, and then you're allocated seats in the legislature, right? Um, so then... Uh, a lot of stuff happened that many of you probably remember. 100,000 people marching in the streets of Madison, a huge controversy that made national news for weeks on end around labor rights, massive cuts to education funding. Um, I'm not trying to tell you, whatever your politics, that you should agree or disagree with the choices that were made by the Republican majority in 2011. They had won the election, they made their choices, we can all agree it was controversial, whether you agree with what they did or not. It was clearly something that people paid a lot of attention to. And so over the course of those two years, we had single party control in Wisconsin state government, and there was a reaction. And the reaction is normal. This is what has always happened in Wisconsin politics. And Democrats got about 170,000 more assembly votes than Republicans two years later. It was a swing of about 420,000 votes. Now, there were about two and a half million voters, and the swing was 420,000 votes. So it was a pretty significant swing in the vote. But in the meantime, one of the things that the Republicans did is they got to draw the maps all by themselves. And I'll tell more about like that process a little bit later in the program. Um, and when they drew those maps, they said, well, we want to try to kind of do what we can to predetermine the outcome of the election. And so what happened is even though there was this massive swing and this massive reaction, the Republicans still got 60 seats in the state assembly, and the Democrats got 39. Even though there was this massive swing in the vote, the, the seat allocation stayed the same. Now let's look at that in a couple of more charts, and I apologize for the, the small writing. So I just want you to look at the colored bars. You don't have to worry about the numbers. I'll explain that as best I can. So this is 2010. These are the votes. These are the seats. The Republicans got a lot more votes in 2010. And they got a lot more seats, right? That matches up. Very simple. It matches up. In 2012, the Democrats got more votes. They didn't get as many more votes, right, as the Republicans. They won a smaller aggregate victory. But you can see the total disconnect, right? But the Republicans got a lot more seats, right? So this vote to seat allocation was not only not similar, it was completely disconnected, completely disconnected. Let's look at 2014 and 2018. I didn't include 2016 just because there's only, it would have been one more slide, but you'll see what the numbers are. 
Um, in 2014, the Republicans again got way more votes, right? And then they got more seats. So that's actually, this is a rational result. But where we're struggling is if I go back, right, the vote is going up and down. But the seat allocation isn't going up and down. It's staying pretty much the same, right? In fact, the Republicans won a big victory in 2014, and they got three more seats. So now it turned into 6336, okay? Uh, this is a wrong, this is backwards. Uh, it's, you know, that's how I screw up the data. All right, so what happened in 2018, and I was doing this on the fly this afternoon, is the, the Democrats actually got more seats. This, these, these are reversed. So the Democrats got 1.3 vote, million votes, and the Republicans got 1.1 million votes. So imagine this is reversed. Never do anything on the fly. This is what happens. And then, even though the Democrats got more votes, the Republicans got way more seats, right? In between, they had picked up a couple seats in 2016, so they actually lost one seat in 2018 from 2016, but it was completely disconnected. Well, that would have been a lot better if the graphs had been correct. Let's cut that part out of the YouTube presentation. What we expect is that your vote will count, that when you vote, you might vote always Democrat, you might vote always Republican, or you might be a swing voter and independent in the middle. You might choose to vote in every election. You might not vote in elections in which you're not inspired by the candidates. The combination of all of that means when your vote counts is that the seat should be allocated. And that's how we have representative democracy. That's how we have a reflective democracy in which campaigns and elections are meaningful. But we've lost that in Wisconsin. So we attribute that to partisan gerrymandering. You've heard this term gerrymandering. Let me define it a little bit. Traditionally, gerrymandering was seen, whether it was for partisan reasons or racial reasons, as a, a manipulation of the shapes of districts. So in 1812, the governor of Massachusetts led an effort to redistrict, to draw new district lines, to know where people would be elected from in the legislature. His name was Elbridge Gerry, G-E-R-R-Y. And he drew this district that was kind of seen as the most corrupt and manipulated district up in the top corner of Massachusetts. And so editorial cartoonists drew this editorial cartoon uh, to uh, incorporate that shape. And they called it, uh, they said that this animal looked like a salamander. Now, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I would go into the parks, and there would be salamanders. I never saw anything that looked like that. If I saw something like that, I would think that there were dragons in the wash. I don't know why they didn't call it a Jerry Dragon, but apparently that's, salamanders were much scarier looking 200 years ago. I don't know why. This is evolution in practice right here. Um, and so, uh, and they wanted to, they, they wanted to uh, 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 mock his name. So instead of calling him Gary, which was his name, they called him Jerry. Apparently that was a massive insult in immediate post-colonial Massachusetts, who knew? Um, and so that's where the term gerrymander came into being. Um, but it's something that's happened kind of throughout American history. The idea that you would manipulate the maps, um, often you'd see kind of these shapes, and there's all different kinds of reasons for these shapes. These are four districts for after the 2010, 2011 redistricting in different states. Um, this is a district in Maryland um, that was drawn by Democrats to disenfranchise uh, suburban and rural Republicans. So what they did is they took a bunch of people from kind of inside Baltimore. There's a lot more people right here. Okay, this is very dense. And then they pulled all these other people in here and they said, we're gonna basically disenfranchise those people. And this incredible districts that are shaped in crazy ways. But the districts don't have to be weirdly shaped in order to predetermine and manipulate the outcome. If you look at this map of the legislative districts in Illinois and you look at this district here or this district here, or this district here, they don't look that crazy, right? They look, you know, pretty normal. But this map is drawn to guarantee a Democratic majority, right? Even if you can't visually see it. So it's not just about funny shapes, right? It's not just about using lots of squiggly lines. Um, the point is that you just want to have clear partisan purposes. Now, this is a map of Wisconsin. And, you know, if you just looked at this, you wouldn't think that much of it. I mean, this, this does look a little funky right here, right? And you can see the third district goes like this. We are uh, right here, right? Am I, am I right about where we are? We're right here. So this looks pretty normal, right? The eighth district, a little bit of here, a little bit here. It's probably for population. The way that this map was drawn 
it wasn't actually just to help uh, a Republican. The Republicans also wanted to help a Democrat. What they did was they exchanged this area, Stevens Point, for this area. They just they switched them. So this had been in the third district, and this had been up here in the seventh district. What that did is it took all these Democrats in Portage County and it added them to Ron Kine's district in southwestern Wisconsin. And it gave Sean Duffy a whole bunch more Republicans in Wood County and right through here. So it made this district more Republican, it made this district more Democratic, and it left voters kind of by the by not to have as much of a choice in elections, right? Clear partisan purposes. So let's just use a words definition instead of a visual definition. We just want to attempt to establish political advantage for a party or a group by manipulating the boundaries to create these particular districts to protect incumbents or to protect partisans. That's the definition. Um, so what our focus is, is we don't want to worry just about funny shapes. We want to worry about that misalignment of votes and seats, right? We want votes to result in seats. And when those things are misaligned, we know that we have a problem, right? Now, I have to be real clear here that the Constitution of the United States, the Wisconsin Constitution, does not require proportional representation. This is an important point. When you get 55% of the vote for your party, that doesn't mean you get 55% of the seats. That's not how that works, because we have single member districts. And if there's a lot of close elections, but one party wins all of them, they're gonna win more seats, right? So it's normal if you get 55% of the vote to get 60 or 65% of the seats. Mathematically, I told you there'd be a little bit of math, that's normal. But what we do think the Constitution requires is partisan symmetry. And here's what that means. That means that if you're a Republican and you're a Democrat, and you're, the Republicans get 55% of the vote, and you get 65% of the seats, but then in the next election, your Democrats get 55% of the vote, well, then we think you should get 65% of the seats. That the allocation should be, this, should be similar for both sides. That there shouldn't be a predetermined bias that one party needs to get less votes in order to have a majority. That doesn't make any sense. That's not democracy, right? Democracy is you vote, you pick who you want, and then that side gets power to do what they want. And at the end of the day, that means that the majority should rule. And as you saw from those earlier uh, graphs, as best as I could do them when I get the colors wrong, um, the majority right now in many elections does not rule, right? What has happened in Wisconsin politics is the majority has gone back and forth in these elections, kind of massively, right? One election it was the Republicans were up, then the Democrats were up in 2012, the Republicans were up in 2014, in 2016 it was pretty close to tied, in 2018 the Democrats won another big election, it went back and forth, but the seat allocation stayed the same. They barely changed at all throughout the decade because we've totally disconnected having elections Mean, meaning what seats that you get. So I'm asserting that that's what they did. And you're like, well, but how do they do that? Like what, when you say that they predetermined what happens in the election, how do you actually draw map lines to predetermine elections? And there's an actual practice. There's a way to do it, and it's called packing and cracking. So if your goal is to misalign seats and votes, you pack and crack voters. And this is an actual like geography. And I, you weren't expecting a science lesson uh, uh, out here at the library tonight, but let me actually try to do this kind of visually. So packing is taking as many of your opponent's voters as possible and putting them into as few districts as possible, but they're going to win big victories in those districts, right? So in this case in Wisconsin, Republicans took as, all, as many Democrats as they could. They packed them into a handful of districts, but the Democrats get like 85% of the votes in those districts, right? So they use up a lot of their votes. And then the votes that are left, they crack them, they put them into the rest of the districts where they don't have any hope of winning the majority, but they're gonna lose by smaller margins. So instead of getting 85-15 or 80-20 wins, you're gonna have 65-35 or 60-40 wins. But you're gonna have a lot more of those wins, okay? Now I know it's hard to kind of to hear out loud, so let me try to do it visually. Imagine four districts, imagine 64 voters, and imagine, is that 64 voters? Yeah, 64 voters, and imagine that, generically speaking, those voters are pretty evenly split. 
Now, some of the purple voters might be hardcore partisans, and some of them might be more independent leaning, but they mostly vote for the Green Party, and the purple voters mostly vote for the purple party, and they live in all these places, and if you draw the districts fairly, and that doesn't mean that they have to be straight lines, we just did that here. Um, basically, you're gonna have four districts in which campaigns matter, and elections matter, and candidates matter. Here's what that means. Let's say you're in this district in the top left, and the green candidate is a very good candidate. They're connected to their community, they raise some money to get their message out, they knock on a lot of doors, they're well presented, they're, they speak about the issues well, and they persuade one or two of these purple voters that lean the other way to vote for them, right? Those independent leaning voters. Well, in that district, the green candidate's gonna win, okay? But then you go to the next district, and the purple candidate is a lot better. The purple candidate is someone who, you know, grew up in that community, really understands those local issues, is connected to the Rotary, and is connected to the Winchester Academy, and is connected to all those things. And so they persuade a couple of these green voters, and then they win. And in every one of those districts, if you have kind of this fair fight set up, the election is going to matter. You're going to have to persuade your voters to show up. You're going to have to actually go out there and campaign and convince people to vote for you in the democracy. But if I take that same geography and I just draw the lines differently, right, I can decide ahead of time what's going to happen. So I've got one district in which we have a lot of green voters, and it's a lot, a lot, a lot of green voters, right? The, the, the margin here is 14 to 2. It's a massive green advantage in that one district, okay? Bottom, bottom left is U-shaped district. Then I have three districts in which the margin is 10 to 6. So it's not as crazy a margin. It's not 14 to 2, it's 8 to 6. But it, I'm sorry, 10 to 6. But it's still a pretty significant majority compared to these even splits over here, right? So now I look at this green district, and this green candidate is nuts. They're way out there. They don't even you know, pay attention to the issues, but they've got the right label next to their name, and so they're going to win this election no matter what they do. They don't have to try at all. They're going to win. And, and basically, the Purple Party has conceded this election to the Green Party. But then in these three districts, it doesn't matter how good the Green candidate is. Like, this Purple candidate doesn't even shower every day. This Purple candidate has no idea what they're talking about. This Purple candidate is just a single-issue activist on something that they you know, heard about on the Internet. But in each case, you, the Green candidate, no matter how hard they try, they're not going to persuade enough partisans from the other side to come over. And the purple candidate's going to win. And so what happens here is you don't even have to have the election, right? I know what's going to happen. I can read that map and tell you the purple party is going to get three elected people. The green party is going to get one elected person, and that's it. We, don't even, we can just cancel the election. It doesn't matter. I know what's going to happen. That's what we have in Wisconsin. We know. We know in 95% of districts what's going to happen. It doesn't matter if we have the election or not. It doesn't matter how good the candidate is. It doesn't matter how much money they raise. It doesn't matter how many doors they knock on. It doesn't matter how much they study the issues. In these assembly districts and in most of these Senate districts, we know what is going to happen. And that's been borne out. It's been between 60 and 64 seats for the Republicans in every election for eight years. 10, 12, well, 10 wasn't manipulated. So 12, 14, 16, 18. Four elections. And that swing, right, from 60 to 64 is totally disconnected from the massive swing in the vote, which has gone up and down and back and forth between both parties that whole time. Let me show you what that looks like in practice in Wisconsin. So this is Racine County, this is Kenosha County. And these, this is up here, uh, this is Milwaukee, this is Waukesha, this is Ozaki up here. Historically, Racine has had a Senate district and Kenosha has had a Senate district. And they're pretty close to the county lines. They're not exactly because the population has to be the same, but they're pretty close. And each of them have a kind of democratic city surrounded by rural conservative areas. A democratic city is surrounded by rural conservative areas. For the last couple of decades or longer, Kenosha has been pretty democratic because there's more people here that kind of outnumber the people out in the rest of Kenosha County. But Kenosha County sees itself as one thing, and that senator has to be responsive to the whole district. 
In Racine, this is the most swingy district the state had seen. The incumbent was recalled twice. People were, were elected by the thinnest of margins. They're the closest elections of any Senate district, kind of just historically. And it went back and forth. Sometimes the Republican won, sometimes the Democrat won. Sometimes the Republican won, sometimes the Democrat won. Up here in Milwaukee County, the fifth district, that was a swingy district where, I'm sorry, over here, where you had a red west and a blue uh, east and a middle mixed part. And that went back and forth between the Republicans and the Democrats. So when the Republicans were redrawing the map in 2011, they said, well, we can't have that anymore. We're going to completely wipe out how we do these districts, because even though we've done them that way historically, we're going to draw one vertical district that incorporates most of both cities of the Racine and Kenosha, and then one district over here. And what that did here is it basically guaranteed a blue district here. This is always going to be a Democratic senator. But it guaranteed that this was always going to be a Republican senator. So where here you had a swingy district that went back and forth, and the election mattered, and the incumbent had to go out and convince people on both sides to vote for them, that was no longer the case. This person, doesn't matter what they do, the Republican's going to win. Doesn't matter how hard they work, doesn't matter how they vote, the Republican's going to win. Now, up here, they did the same thing. They pushed the 5th District west. They made these four, there's four, congressional, four Senate districts in here. They made these even bluer, and then they guaranteed that the Republican would win this district by like a massive margin. So where it had swung back and forth, a couple times between Republicans and Democrats, now the Republican, in fact, one election, the Republican didn't even have an opponent. Because it's not even worth trying. We know what's going to happen in the election. This is the same map, it's just a different colors. You can see kind of total, you know, horizontal stack districts to one vertical district and then one big rural district. And they just intentionally decided to do it that way so they could predetermine the outcome of the election. Now, there is a consequence to that. The consequence is increased polarization. Because not only do Republicans only need to worry about Republican voters, but now Democrats only have to worry about Democratic voters. There are going to be fewer of them, but they are going to be on both sides more extreme. They are going to go to the wings of their parties, which is antithetical to how Wisconsin had done business politically for more than a century before that, this increased polarization. And that means that legislators are playing to those extremes instead of trying to find a way to talk to each other in the middle. And the bipartisan consensus and the bipartisan compromise that was the signature hallmark of good government in Wisconsin for decades has completely broken down. And it's broken down very, very quickly. This didn't have, you know, usually you hear about things in politics changing over time. In this case, things happen like that. Because once the maps were rigged, the politics just changed, and the way people did business just changed. For people of all political persuasions, the things that we had consensus about, we just don't have the same consensus. UW funding, I mean, I'll tell you, Governor Tommy Thompson, who was a conservative Republican, but he cared about catering to the middle, and he wanted to get 60% of the vote, right? He wanted to go out and get everybody to like him and vote for him. And one of the things that they did in partnership with the business community is they invested in the University of Wisconsin. You know, we wanted a world-class university system, and there was a consensus. It didn't matter if you were Republican or Democrat or independent. You wanted a world-class university. Now, we might have argued about funding levels a little bit or tuition levels or policy things on the margins, right? But the idea that we wanted a world-class university was something that there was consensus around. Road funding. I tell a story. I grew up in New Berlin, a suburb of Milwaukee. And we had family and friends in Indiana and Ohio. So every year, a couple of times a year, we'd load up into my parents' 76 Pontiac Bonneville, big old boat car. I was an only child. I'd have the whole back seat to myself. I could lay down, and my feet and my head wouldn't touch the doors. It was so wide back there. And we would get in the car, and I would lay down. I'd be reading. I'd fall asleep, and we'd head south on 94, and we'd hit the Illinois border. And what would happen? I would wake up. He made the little symbol. You'd know from the roads, right? You'd know from the roads. I mean, this is not like a joke, right? You'd know from the roads when you hit the Illinois border. And then you'd drive along, and then you'd come back, and you'd hit you'd, the Wisconsin roads, and you'd be like, wow, we really know how to take care of our infrastructure in Wisconsin. That was a bipartisan consensus to keep our infrastructure strong for our economy and our community. Now, I will tell you, try this little game. Drive south on 94. Don't close your eyes if you're the driver. 
But everyone else in the car, close your eyes and try to figure out when you hit the Illinois border. You can tell. You can tell. Because in Illinois, all the fiscal problems they've got in Illinois, they've made a commitment to fixing that damn road, right? And it is much smoother. Now, they are putting money into I-94 south of uh, um, Milwaukee, but it's like this project that's taking 10 years. We used to be able to do these projects in a couple of years, right? And it's just taking forever. Water protection, Northwoods uh, uh, mining protections. These were things that were bipartisan uh, that we cared about. Um, but that's because now there's not any accountability because usually, you know, if people didn't do what the great majority wanted, you'd have an election and there'd be a consequence. And so people would feel compelled to be responsive to both sides. We don't have that anymore. Ideology now trumps progress. So you have an election, you win the majority of vote. Right now in Wisconsin, if you're the Democrats, you still don't have any chance of attaining a majority. Uh, incumbents are protected on both sides. Enthusiasm is dampened. Now, let me give you a real practical example of how this plays out in a local community like Wapaka. Although I'm not going to talk about Wapaka, I'm going to talk about Eau Claire. This is a woman named Wendy Sue Johnson. And when this photograph was taken, she was a member of the Eau Claire School Board, an elected member of the school board. And this woman right here is named Kathy Bernier. And at the time, she was a state representative uh, representing uh, uh, Eau Claire, and she actually represented Wendy Sue Johnson in the legislature. Um, this picture was taken at a breakfast that had long for decades taken place in Eau Claire. And it was all the local school district board members and leaders and all the state legislators from both parties in kind of the surrounding area, Eau Claire and Chippewa Valley, right? And there were always Democrats and Republicans from the legislators. There were always conservatives and liberals from the school boards. Everybody came together to talk about what was happening in their local schools because everybody cares about their local schools. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. If you send your kids to public school, if your family send their kids to public school, even if you don't send your kids to public schools, you care about your schools being strong in your community. That is a hallmark of Wisconsin political culture. Um, this is probably just a coincidence, but you can kind of see the look on Kathy's face. Uh, so Wendy Sue is talking about the cuts to education from Scott Walker's first budget, and she's complaining. She'll acknowledge that. She ended up being a plaintiff in our lawsuit. She wasn't very happy. A lot of people weren't very happy. In fact, some of the conservative school board members from the Eau Claire area were like, look, there's a real consequence to the quality of education in our schools, on class size, on the ability to, to program specials, et cetera. And so Kathy Bernier, got up from this meeting shortly after this picture was taken, and without a word, she stood up and she walked out. And the local media said, well, why are you leaving, Representative Bernier? And she said, talking to these people is worse than going to the dentist. She just didn't want to hear it. She just didn't want to hear it. And they were drawing the lines. And the line where Kathy Bernier's district used to incorporate Wendy Sue Johnson's house, they drew the line right down her street, and they pushed Wendy Sue Johnson into the next district over because she was worried that Wendy Sue Johnson, the elected member of the school board, was going to run against her. And so they literally just drew her out of the district. And Kathy said, I don't need to come to this anymore. I don't need to hear this. I don't need to listen to the, to the criticism. I'm not going to come anymore. This meeting, which took place for decades, no longer takes place. That was the last one. They just don't have the meeting anymore. The Republicans and the Democrats and the local school board, but they don't talk to each other in any formal setting because they just don't have to because the re-election happens. You get elected either way. She's now in the state Senate, Kathy Bernier, in a gerrymandered district. And uh, Wendy Sue moved and ran for the assembly seat and lost because the district's gerrymandered, right? That's just how it works. So we think this is a huge problem. Now I want to turn my attention more than halfway done here. So what do we do about it? There are a couple things that we can do. One is we can change the process for who draws the map. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Republicans drew the maps and why that was problematic. Um, the problem here is the decision about who draws the map is made by the legislature. And they're not going to change the process that elected them and created these majorities that aren't accountable. The courts can't change it. Frankly, the voters can't change it because we don't have initiative. We don't have the, the, a process for voters to go around the legislature and go directly to a referendum. Other states have that process. We don't have that. So what we realized is what we needed to do is sue and say that this was unconstitutional. And that would change the outcome of the actual map. We could change the standards by which the map was drawn. 
Um, and when I say we, this is where I'm talking about citizens. So I was a local volunteer uh, in the Democratic Party. I was the local chair. Uh, the head of the NAACP was saying our people are getting disenfranchised, some state legislators, some lawyers. And we started meeting over breakfast to say, look, we just went through this election in 2012. This was six years ago this month, February 2013. We just went through this election. The Democrats won the election massively. Barack Obama was elected by seven points in Wisconsin in 2012. Tammy Baldwin won by five points over Tommy Thompson. I just want to take a second to think about that. The out progressive lesbian member of Congress from Madison beat the most popular politician in modern Wisconsin history, the four-term governor, Tommy Thompson, by five points. Now look, Tammy's a good candidate. I don't think Tommy ran the best race of his life, but some of that was that the Democrats were ascendant, right? But yet they'd only gotten less than 40% of the seats in the legislature. So we got together, we said, what do we do? We started to learn about the law, and we said, if we file a lawsuit, we can at least change the conversation. We may not win the lawsuit, but we need to get people engaged in the conversation. And I will tell you, in spring of 2013, if I told somebody I wanted to give a lecture on gerrymandering, there wouldn't be 50 people in Wapaka wanting to sit on a, degree, on a six degree night, right, to come out and talk about it. We wanted to change the conversation. So we had to figure out what the law was. And I'm not gonna spend a lot, are there any lawyers in the room? One lawyer. You're really gonna enjoy the next two minutes. So there were a series of cases that went to the Supreme Court from Indiana, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin. Over the course of those cases, we found a couple things. And I'm not getting into the weeds here. The lawyer's presentation is like 10 slides on the law. I'm not a lawyer, I just play one on TV. Um, but I'm not gonna do that here, because it gets very mind-numbing, even more than the math. The law is even more mind-numbing than the math. The decision was, yes, if you rig the maps like this for partisan purposes, we think that's unconstitutional, but we don't know how to measure it. We've not found a constitutional test, right? That's my summary of all of these cases. But Justice Kennedy issued an invitation in the case out of Pennsylvania in 2004. And what he said was, I'll just read some of these words, I would not foreclose all possibility of relief if some limited and precise rationale were found to correct an established constitutional violation. So what he's saying is if you could tell me how to see it, right, then I could see there being a, a judicial relief, that you could win a lawsuit. That a workable standard has not yet uh, emerged for measuring this burden doesn't mean that one won't emerge in the future, right? So we pull this language out and lawyers looked at it and said he's issuing an invitation. Bring us a test, bring us a measurement, right? And if you bring us a measurement, maybe we will have a way to measure whether there's too much gerrymandering and we can try to put a stop to it. So we met this law professor from the University of Chicago. He came up to Wisconsin, Nick Stephanopoulos, and he said, I've got a test. And he called it the efficiency gap. And it was a measure of this thing called partisan symmetry, which I measured earlier, which is this idea that how do you see if votes go one way that that party gets uh, the, the seats, and if votes go the other way, then that party gets the seats, right? You want to measure that mathematically. And so he has this formula that you run on the election results, and you can see whether or not the map is fair or not. And then there's other tests that kind of are other ways to measure partisan symmetry. Um, and so we had this test and we filed a case. And it was just a bunch of citizens who said, you know what, let's recruit some plaintiffs. Let's find some lawyers we're willing to take the case on. Let's uh, hire some experts. Let's do all the things you have to do to file a case. And you know what, by golly, we're gonna take this to the Supreme Court. And it was just a bunch of people. In 2014, State Representative Fred Kessler who was just a local state representative, former judge who lived in Milwaukee, we we're gonna do it. And we recruited 12 plaintiffs from around the state just by networking. Uh, we found some counsel in Wisconsin who were willing to take a flyer. We created a partnership with this national group called the Campaign Legal Center who went out and raised some money and said, we're gonna help you and not charge you anything. We hired some experts with that money. We got a bunch of pro bono legal time and we filed a case in federal court. Now we started working in February of 2013 the case didn't get filed until July of 2015. And there'd been an election in the meantime because it took that long to get it organized, right? To, to have the experts to do their studies, to recruit the plaintiffs, to hire the lawyers. So we're now two elections into these rigged maps and we file this case. Whole process goes on. What we wanted in the case was basically for the court to say this test, this three-part test 
with the efficiency gap as the measurement inside that test would be uh, the solution to our problem. It's very similar to the test that they use for racial gerrymandering. So we're building on the law that already existed. We're not asking them to create new law out of whole cloth. We're trying to build on the law that already exists. That's called being doctrinally incremental, right? You like that? Is a lawyer like that term, doctrinally incremental? Um, so this was the test that we, we, we proposed, which is that we had to show that the people who drew the maps had partisan intent that they were successful, that they had a partisan effect with their test, and that that effect was going to be sustained, and that they didn't have any other good reason to draw it that way, right? That was basically what we had to prove. And it's very similar to the test for racial gerrymandering, which has been something that is unconstitutional for 30 years, right? That has been used as a test for a long time. So we needed to, we needed to figure out partisan intent. We needed to figure out how we were going to prove that. And there's a whole story here that I have to shorten a little bit for time, but basically, there had been an earlier case, and in the earlier case, there had been discovery, which is like the gathering of evidence, and the Republican legislators had withheld a bunch of information that the court had ordered them to, to make public. And through a series of events, it was found that this evidence existed. I think there was a mistake somewhere, you know, a document got posted and it turned out like, oh, there's a list of documents, and it turned out that they hadn't turned all the documents over. And the federal courts got very mad. And even though the previous case had ended, our lawyers were able to go into federal court and get the judges to find the other side, the lawyers for the Republican majority, and order them to turn the physical computers over. Because they weren't submitting the documents in the process. So they said, we don't trust you anymore. You actually have to hand the physical computers over. And they said some of them were destroyed, and this hard drive had been erased, but they physically had to take the hard drive out of the computer and turn it over, even though they tried to erase it. And there was actually an exchange. It was like a bad custody handoff at the McDonald's playroom where their lawyers had to bring the computer into a neutral law office and set it on the table and back away. And our lawyers came and they picked up the computer uh, or the hard drive and they took the hard drive to a forensic specialist who had worked for the US Secret Service and now was a computer uh, forensic expert in Minneapolis. And he was like, yes, it's been erased, but they didn't do a good job erasing it. So we're going to find the data on this hard drive, and it costs tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds, like oodles of money, but the money was raised to do that. And they found these spreadsheets that had never been disclosed before that described the process, that showed the process that the Republicans in 2011 used to draw these maps. Now, they had hired consultants, and they'd created the secret map room across the street from the Capitol. This had all kind of come out over the years. Um, they made uh, Republican legislators sign confidentiality agreements. Um, and they started with the map that was used the previous decade, the 2000s map. And because of demographic change, that map was at about 49 seats that were solidly Republican. So this, is, this, this goes from 48 to 60 is the number of seats here. And then they drew a map, and I'm just going to read the titles of the file names. There were hundreds of file names, but I'm just going to read a few of them. Joe Base Map Basic. Joe was a former state legislator who they'd hired as a consultant to draw these maps. And then the next one is Joe Base Map Assertive. So they went from Joe Base Map Basic to Joe Base Map Assert Assertive. Then they went to Joe Assertive. Then they went to Joe Aggressive 1. Joe Aggressive 2, and then they had some more maps. And as they drew these maps, they went from 49 seats for the Republicans to 52 seats to the Republicans to 56 seats, 57, 58, 59. And then they kept tweaking the map and they tweaked it, and it was still 59, it was still 59, but they were strengthening the 59, and they were strengthening it, so that there's no way they'd ever go below 59 seats using that packing and cracking. And they kept redrawing the lines just a little bit. And the final map, and it was literally called Final Map, that was the, final, that was the name of the file, and that was the one that they passed into law, that was the one that they made Act 43 to draw the maps, and it was the single most aggressive gerrymander of all of the hundreds of maps that they draw. They picked the worst one. They're like, we're gonna go as far as we can. And the court looked at that and they said, and this is Judge Ripple, who was a Republican appointed judge. He was appointed by Ronald Reagan. He's a federal judge. He said, it's clear the drafters were concerned with and convinced of the durability of their play. They were convinced that this was going to work. They had partisan intent. So then we hired another expert um, and he measured he got all the data he could find 
for 200 different maps from 40 states over the course of 50 years. So 40 states with publicly available data with single member districts, legislatures all over the country, 800 plus elections, and they measured all of them. And by one measure, the Wisconsin map was the most aggressively gerrymandered map in modern American history. By another measure, it was the fourth out of 800. And the only reason it wasn't in the top three is because the other three weren't in the first election after drawing. Demographic chains had pushed them further, right? This was literally the most aggressively gerrymandered map in modern American history. And that's what we passed in the law in Wisconsin. Those are the maps that we have today in Wisconsin that your state senate and your state assembly are elected from. And the judges said it, 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 was, it was successful. Not only were they, did they have the intent, but they achieved their effect, and it secured for Republicans a lasting assembly majority. Okay? Then we had to prove that, there was, that you could do it fairly, essentially, right? That there was, they could have said, look, yeah, it's totally gerrymandered, but this is the only way to draw it and you know, care about communities of interest and care about the Voting Rights Act. But we proved, we showed that you know, here's their map, or here's the old map, here's their map, and then here's a map that we drew. Uh, and we showed mathematically that you could draw a map that instead of having like a 13% bias, would only have a 2% bias, right? That you could draw a fair map. And so we proved that the partisan effect couldn't be justified by the legitimate state concerns and neutral factors that traditionally bear on the process. Again, this is the regular point in judge writing for the court. Now, all of this litigation is to get to this point that if we win, we get to actually have a rule that says you can't rig the maps too much, right? That's the goal. It'll be possible to throw out a map. And it's not just on who draws the map. It's not a process-based win. Whoever's drawing the map, whether it's an independent commission, or it's politicians, or it's a nonpartisan attorney, or whoever draws it, they have to make the map fair if we win, okay? If we don't win, at least we're changing the conversation. Right? We're exposing all this information. If we hadn't filed this lawsuit, you wouldn't know that they picked the most rigged maps of all their hundreds of maps because they didn't, they didn't respond to open records requests. They literally just broke the law and didn't disclose all that information right? because they didn't want people to know how much they were rigging the maps. Um, so we can start talking to voters about these issues. And my view is it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. You shouldn't be in favor of manipulating our democracy this way. And that's why we have Republicans and Democrats across the state agreeing with us that this needs to change. And that doesn't mean the Democrats should suddenly get to rig the maps. We want to change it so nobody can rig the maps, right? That's where we want to get to. Um, and we're engaging in that conversation. And I'm getting to give lectures like this to audiences like this who traditionally would never have listened to something with math and law and you know words like gerrymander, right? It's just rare that you get to have that conversation. Um, and we're building the infrastructure across the country to have that conversation. Now, we won the case, kinda. If you think that's good, you can applaud. Um, there was a trial in May of 2016 in which witnesses appeared on the stand and expert testimony was introduced. There were a series of motions. We won all the motions. And then in November of 2016, after the election, the court issued a ruling. Now, three elections have passed. Three elections have happened under these rigged maps in which the results did not comport with what the people had voted for. There was that disconnect three times. And the court said um, that the legislative maps were unconstitutional um, and that this was essentially this is the first time that a map had been overturned in this manner because the court accepted, the lower court accepted this test that we'd come up with. The court issued a very clear ruling. They said that the maps were unconstitutional because they intended to burden the representational rights of these voters by impeding their ability to translate their votes into legislative seats. So remember me, the advocate earlier, talking about votes and seats? This isn't me talking. This is the court talking, right? This is a federal judge appointed by Ronald Reagan writing a decision saying that's unconstitutional. Um, and uh, they also said the discriminatory effect is not explained by the political geography of Wisconsin. What the Republican majority will say today, every time they talk about this, they say, well, look, this is just the natural consequence because there's more Republicans and because we, we, you know, this is where we live and blah, blah. And the court said very clearly, no, we, we, see, we saw mathematical evidence that proved that the discriminatory effect is not explained by the political geography of Wisconsin. So it is an unconstitutional political gerrymander. It was a 159-page it was a 120-page decision and then a 40-page uh, dissent. So it was a 2-1 decision. 
And the, the, the dissenting judge, who's a good judge, he didn't really say that all of the things we proved about the Republicans didn't happen. He said they did happen. It just isn't clear to him that the Constitution prohibits it, right? So there were three judges on the panel. We won two to one. So then it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, uh, heard the case in October of 2017. And then they basically punted the case in June of 2018. And they did not make a decision. Uh, we thought we could get Justice Kennedy to say, hey, you've, you've responded to our invitation. Uh, he, they issued the ruling. And um, weeks later, Justice Kennedy said he was stepping down. And he left the court. Um, and his uh, son was working for some Trump ally. And uh, his former uh, clerk, Brett Kavanaugh, was uh, nominated. Uh, we did get seven justices to say the case should continue. We want more evidence. It was basically on a process technicality. They said we needed to show more standing. In other words, more uh, the, the, the plaintiffs had to show how they were personally affected by this. So we'd kind of proven the effect on the whole state, but we hadn't gone individually, plaintiff by plaintiff, to say how they were individually burdened. We'd just chosen not to do that. We didn't think the law leading up to that point required us to do that. Um, but that was the reason they gave. Uh, two justices said, kill the case. Let the Republicans gerrymander in Wisconsin. Let the Democrats gerrymander in Massachusetts. We don't care. It's not unconstitutional. Politicians can rig the maps. That's just the way it is. That was uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch. The other seven said, no, 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 no. We think there's still an issue here. We just need to go a little farther. So that uh, was originally then kicked to a new trial in April of this year. It's now been delayed again to July. The reason being that there's another set of cases from Maryland and Massachusetts that are going to reach the court next month. And there's going to be oral argument in those cases. In the North Carolina case, what did I, I said it's Maryland and North Carolina. In the North Carolina case, this, the, the facts are very similar to our facts. Okay, So very similar. Our trial delayed to July. The Rucho case from North Carolina will be argued in March while he decided in June. In the meantime, the state is spending oodles and oodles of money your tax dollars to defend the rig maps, three and a half million dollars and counting. Our neighboring state of Iowa uses a nonpartisan process. They spend less than $200,000 to draw their maps, and there are no challenges. We've spent three and a half million dollars already. Um, the GOP talks about it being the candidates, not the districts. We've proven that wrong in court, lots of evidence. Um, so whatever happens, look, our expectations should be realistic. We are trying to make the process fair. We're not trying to win it for one side or the other. Um, there will still probably be some map manipulation. We were trying to shave off the worst cases. So there was actually some math around that. We said the limit should be a 7% bias. Wisconsin has a 13% bias right now. We drew a map with a 2% bias. But you had to find where the line was that we thought the court would accept. And so we said, look, there's going to be some gerrymandering, but you have to give a majority a chance to have the majority of seats if they win a majority of votes. No matter what happens, think back to the Green and Purple Party, the candidates are going to always matter if you have fair elections, right? So if we get rid of rigged maps, that doesn't mean Republicans will never win again. It just means that the Democrats have a fighting chance, right? And in other states, if this ruling applies to the whole country, then the minority party in those states, right, the Republicans in Illinois, would have a fighting chance. They still have to recruit good candidates. They still have to run good campaigns. They have to raise the money. They have to knock on the doors. Um, the process for drawing the maps will still be the same. But we get fairer maps, not necessarily fair maps, but fairer maps to move the ball forward. So that's the strategy around litigation that we pursued. We're still fighting to change the process. And because now we have a governor and we have split party control in Wisconsin, the governor supports redistricting reform. In fact, we were asking him to put it in the budget that he's going to introduce on Thursday of this week, Governor Evers. Um, to get reform passed, we have to build on this conversation, and we have to get that bipartisan support from all over the state um, and get the governor to do it in the budget. Now, here's a set of counties. There's 41 counties that are colored in here. Two-thirds of these counties voted for Donald Trump. Two-thirds of them. One-third of them voted for uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016. These are all counties that have passed through their county board a resolution saying to the state, stop rigging the maps. And those county board votes have been three to one in our favor. There are tons of local conservatives in counties all across the state 
including your neighboring county, Outagamey, neighboring county, Portage, Wakanto, Langlade, Lincoln County, Force County. Wapak is still blank right here. But in all these counties, they've said, whether they're local liberals or they're local conservatives, that they want the process to stop being rigged, right? So that's something you can do right here in Wapak is try to get your Wapak County Board to go on record to say to the state, stop rigging the maps. And um, we want to keep the public engaged. I do speeches like this at town halls, at public meetings, telling the story, trying to get people to, uh, to pass local resolutions, to pass local referenda, um, to get the governor to take action. What will happen in the next redistricting is if the Republican legislature tries to rig the maps, Tony Evers has said publicly he will veto it. And maybe the map drawing will go kick back to the court. And this is kind of the last thing I'm going to say. In modern Wisconsin history, in the one person, one vote era, so after the civil rights rulings and other constitutional rulings in the 60s, it was decided that all legislative districts had to be essentially equal population. And we've redrawn the maps five times, 71, 81, 91, 01, and 2011. The first four times, the legislature was split and either compromised to draw a fair map, or they couldn't, and they kicked it to the federal courts, and the federal courts drew a fair map. So for 40 years, we had fair maps, 71, 81, 91, 01, and the decades following. In 2011 was the first time in modern Wisconsin history that one party controlled the redistricting process. And they rigged the maps. And they used technology and non-disclosure agreements and lots of taxpayer money to rig the maps more than any map had been rigged anywhere else in the country that we can find in modern American history. Right? Now, I'm not going to tell you that if the Democrats had had control that they wouldn't have done that. I will say that they shouldn't have. Right? They shouldn't in Illinois, they shouldn't in Maryland, they shouldn't in Rhode Island, they shouldn't in Hawaii, they shouldn't in Massachusetts. Those are the five states where we know for sure the Democrats have rigged the maps. But the Republicans shouldn't rig the maps here, or in Michigan, or in Pennsylvania, or in North Carolina, or in Utah, or in Wyoming, or all the other places they rig the maps, right? So we need you as citizens to be engaged. We want you to keep calling on the legislature to do this differently, to do it more openly, to do it more transparently, not to do it in secret. Right? Um, and to do it in a process that like, takes politicians out of the hands of drawing. We want nonpartisan staff at the Legislative Reference Bureau to draw the maps. We want them to be protected from political influence. There's a bill, the Hanson Vining Bill, um, and we want the governor to include that in the budget, and then we want it to pass as part of the budget. So that next time, uh, the map process is drawn fairly. It's not a political compromise. It's truly a fair and representative process. Um, we're going to keep calling the legislature out, um, and especially Speaker Voss and Majority Leader Fitzgerald, for wasting millions of dollars of taxpayer money. You know, we need roads to be fixed. We need lead to be taken out of the water. We need the UW to be funded. We need schools to be funded. We should stop wasting millions of dollars on lawyers to defend the rigged maps just so they can hold on to power. Um, and we need local organizing and grassroots support everywhere, not just in, you know, the most left Democratic places, but also in places like Wapaka that are represented by Republicans in the legislature. You can use letters to the editor, you can talk to your neighbors, um, and of course you can support, as you are uh, by being here tonight, the Fair Elections Project. Um, so I really appreciate it. That's the presentation. Thanks so much. thumbnail for switching that switch on. We have a question right here. Question or comment? I am Linda Cross. I'm a former Wapaka County Republican chairman. Mm -hmm. I remember in the 1980s very well mm -hmm. when Wapaka County was often number one Republican district in county within the state and winning awards. There was a time when I, as a Republican, had no Republican representing me. Mm -hmm. Dave Helbach from Stevens Point mm -hmm. represented me supposedly. He was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Everybody else who supposedly represented me was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that no Democrat at that point ever talked about that being rigged, gerrymandered. Uh -huh. Obviously, it was. It very definitely was. 
So there are no big crocodile tears in my eyes over this issue. It's the way it is in politics. It's up and down. I've been uh, a candidate for office again and again, and I know how it works. Also, when you're talking about the money, Mr. Doyle, when he was Attorney General, would not handle Tommy Thompson's case on school choice. That's what he was supposed to do, being paid his salary. He wouldn't do it. Therefore, Tommy had to hire Ed Marion, another attorney. Mm -hmm. People of Wisconsin got to pay twice. Another time when Jim Doyle was still Attorney General, and my husband was Administrator for Division of Motor Vehicles for the state of Wisconsin, there was a situation where Jim Doyle's people were supposed to be representing my husband's people. They were winning the case. All of a sudden, my husband was told that they would have to settle. What does this have to do with your... It has to do with money that's wasted by people. We are... This gentleman talked about waste of money and how terrible it was. So, twice, the people of Wisconsin had to pay because my husband as head of DMV, went to court with another lawyer to win the case that they were supposed to have won. And the reason that it wouldn't have been won otherwise was because Jim Doyle's people weren't ready at the time that they were supposed to go to court. Well, I've been a teacher all my life, and if I had gone to my principal and said, I can't get my grades finished at the end of the year, he okay. would have said to me, you'd better stay up right. all night as long as right. it takes to get it done on time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's so, get a response. Yeah, so thank you, Ms. Cross. Look, so let me, let me, I'll, I don't have any quarrel with the second point that you made. The argument that I'm making isn't that politicians never waste money, okay? Th there are two ways to look at our disagreement here on the money, and then I'm going to respond to the first point. One is to say, well, sometimes the Democrats waste money and make bad decisions, so it's okay for the Republicans to sometimes waste money when they make bad decisions. Or we could say, the Republicans shouldn't waste money in making bad decisions, and the Democrats shouldn't have wasted money. So I'm not up here justifying some other issue that I'm not nearly the expert that you are on of something that happened 15 or 20 years ago. I hear you. You have, it sounds like a real legitimate complaint. So I don't think that somebody wasting money in the past means that we should suddenly agree to waste money in the present. So I just don't think that that, I mean, there's, there's a different way to respond to that. To your first point, here's the, here's the reality. In 50 years of drawing maps, in 1971, the Republican and Democrat split in the legislature resulted in a negotiated compromise, and they drew a fair map. And we had experts measure the map and introduce the evidence in open federal court, and you can go look at the transcript and look at the data. That map was 100% fair. There was a 0% efficiency gap because it was drawn as a compromise between both parties. In 1981, 91, and 2001, the legislature, the governor, were of split control, and they could not agree on a map. And so what happened in 1981 is the federal court drew the map. The federal court did not have partisan intent. And the measurement of that map, the efficiency gap measurement of that map, was that statewide it was pretty fair. It was less than 5%, less than 4% efficiency gap. And so some of what we think should be in the test is partisan intent. Those federal judges didn't have partisan intent. I don't want to argue with you that you felt, didn't feel unrepresented by Dave Hellbach. Of course you did, and I appreciate that. And, uh, but what I can't say to you is that on the aggregate statewide, that Republicans didn't have a chance at winning a majority for their voters. Clearly they did. They did win majorities in the 80s in both houses, in fact and uh, in the 90s, and in the 2000s. So the idea that like, there wasn't a possibility for Republicans to, to win a majority, that simply isn't true. It was possible, and they did win majorities. What's happened in this decade is the Democrats have won huge majorities of the vote and gotten almost a super minority of the seat allocation. So this like, well, it's always been this way. No, it hasn't always been this way. There's only been one time in modern, political Wisconsin history in the one person, one vote era in which we've had single party control for the drawing. That was in 2011. That was the only time there's ever been a non-disclosure agreement required of a legislator to see their own map 
uh, before it gets introduced on the floor. That's the only time that consultants were hired secretly. That's the only time that, that a, uh, a Republican legislator was fined. A Republican legislative majority was fined by a federal court for illegally withholding evidence from a federal court. Those things, are no, those, those aren't normal. And I don't think it would be okay if Democrats did it. And I'm standing here saying that we should stop the Democrats in Illinois from rigging the maps. And we should stop the Democrats in Maryland from rigging the maps. So what I really quarrel with is this idea that it's just politics. No, we fought the Revolutionary War and we fought the Civil War for representative democracy. And that doesn't mean winning a political game. It means that when we vote, it's meaningful and it represents the will of the voters. And if I lose that election because the other side got more votes, that's the way it is. That's what happened in 2010, right? But in 2012 and in 2018, my side won and we don't have the seats. And that isn't right and it's un-American. So that's my response to that. Other questions? Um, you're uh, talking about the need to redistrict. Now, if you want, if they want to make it fair, when you look at where the Democratic strength is, is in Milwaukee and primarily in Milwaukee and Madison. How would you propose to realign districts without spreading out from Milwaukee, spreading yeah. out from Madison, and that? That's a really good question. To, to, to make things fair. That's a really good question. So there's two answers to that. One is um, we have this process, and it's not just we, all over the country, there's this incumbent protection model, right? Um, if you draw a map and you don't know where the incumbents live, where their addresses are, then you can't manipulate the map to protect those incumbents, right? So just like that, if you don't know where the Democrats and the Republicans live, right, and we actually want to prohibit the map drawers from having access to the data, we actually want that to be prohibited in law from knowing where they are. So they can't manipulate the line. So that way they're drawing, not totally blindly, they still know where the rivers are and where the communities of interest are and they still have demographic data and they still have, uh, they know where, uh, you know, where Nina and Menashe are and they know where Wapak is and where New London is and all those kinds of things. But if you draw it blindly or more blindly, then you're much more likely to get a fair map. Now, there's this perception and it's a population-based perception that Milwaukee, Madison are blue and everywhere else in the state is red. But that's not actually what it is. Milwaukee, Madison are blue. The Wow counties and some other places around the, the state are red. And then there's a bunch of places that are mixed. And we actually had a mathematician measure the distribution of voters across Wisconsin. And they used some fancy term that I don't know what it's called, but some sort of something I correlation, whatever. And they showed mathematically that the distribution of Democratic voters and the density of Democratic voters and the density of Republican voters only deviates by about 2%. That it looks, on a map, it looks like it's just there's these two blue places because there's so many more people in Milwaukee and Madison. But the reality is that there are pockets of very dense red places all over the state as well, and the wild counties are a big part of that. The Milwaukee media market is actually 50-50. It's not all the way blue. If you think about who watches television in Milwaukee, it's 50-50. Now, Madison's very different, right? Madison's different. But Milwaukee is actually, you know, you take the suburbs, and those suburbs are like, if you, that line isn't a, it's, it used to be like a really, like a, 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 a solid line. Now it's like a dotted line, right? Because the suburbs are becoming much more mixed the ones that, that border the city of Milwaukee and that go out to kind of Waukesha County. So the reality is that we think that if you have an independent process, a nonpartisan staff attorney who's not accountable to politicians, drawing the map, using fair criteria, making sure they don't know where incumbents live, making sure that they don't know what the election results are, and then they have public hearings to say, hey, you know, should we draw a line between Nina and Menasha or should we have them together? Should we cut Beloit and Janesville apart, or should we put them together? Should we cut a line through the middle of Sheboygan, or should we keep it together? Those are conversations about like where our community lines are, right? And the drawers can take those kinds of things into account, and we think that they can come up with a fair result. And here's the, here's the other part, is let's say that map has a little bit of a bias. Let's say it's three or four percent more Republican. Because there was no intent, there was no intent to uh, manipulate it, 
then that would pass muster. It would be constitutional. So what I don't get, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but like when Republicans say, well, look, it's just because there's all these people in Milwaukee and Madison, what I say is, okay, great. Let's draw a fair map, and if you think you're going to win a massive majority because there's like these pockets of Milwaukee and Madison, great. Then let's not rig the maps. Prove it. It's that simple, right? And then we'll all have faith in the outcome, and we'll all believe in our democracy, and we'll have confidence that our legislators are going to be accountable to us again. We've got a couple minutes. Any, anybody have a question? Well, I have one myself that I brought up <laughs> to you before at, uh, at dinner, and you said, well, that's a good question. Bring it up again. And the okay. question ends. Uh, I, I can see after your talk, uh, my views were rather uh, naive. But the, the question is, there was a Scientific American article that talked about mm. computers yeah. and algorithms and how a computer could draw the maps and keep the people out of it, just put in the algorithm and have the computer draw the map. Yeah. So I definitely think technology is important, right? We don't draw these maps using slide rules, right? We're not using transparency paper and drawing lines on a map up there, right? You have to use technology. You have to use spreadsheets and census data and all those kinds of things. We do think there needs to be a human element. And the human element goes to knowing and not knowing um, where, like what lines are real lines, right? Is that a creek or is that a river, right? And does it actually separate neighborhoods or are those communities supposed to be together because they're aligned with each other, right? Um, are these communities that historically have been together? There's just too many variables to try to program in the computer and have them spit something out. It just makes more sense for this to be a human process aided by technology, where you can judge it, where you can have an open and transparent conversation. What I really think is wrong is going behind closed doors, having a few elites draw the map, come out, and just say, okay, this is the way it is. That isn't how we do things in Wisconsin, right? We are the sunshine state, the open government state. We had one of the first open records laws. We have very strong open meetings laws, right? If there were uh, a majority of the county board sitting in this room here tonight, Right? And they were debating and they were talking about an issue that they might consider. They'd have to notice the meeting, right? We have these strong laws because we care about how we do things. And so we think that instead of you know, hiding that behind a computer algorithm, that we want to do it out in the open. So that's the way that we would propose doing it, is having human beings have public hearings, have an open process, let anybody submit a map, let anybody give their input, do it as sunshiny as possible, and then vote up or down as to whether you've come up with a product that Hi, my name is John Huffteaser, and um, I'd least, uh, like to say that I don't understand f fair ever. Okay. And um, I don't know that you represented me in any of your graphs because I don't know if I'm a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or a conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you need to think outside the box, to use a too often used phrase, but what about soft boundaries? What about overlapping districts? Yeah. All you're doing is tweaking an old process that's been shown to be um, abused. Yeah, what you say is really great. And let me just say that there are much more extensive innovations that would respond to you as an independent voter. Ranked choice voting, multi-member districts, staggered terms, all of those things would serve democracy better than the current system. So I agree with you that my presentation is within the box of the current constitutional requirements in Wisconsin around a primary election and a general election with a party system in single member districts in which every member of the assembly is elected every year and which every member of the Senate is elected you know, either these two years or those two years. Those are boxes that I'm absolutely in and they are not responsive to what you're talking about. Here's what the one thing I think I am saying that is responsive to what you're talking about, though. And that is that the majority of Wisconsinites are like you, or so the plurality. The plurality of Wisconsinites are like you. They're not hardcore Republicans, and they're not hardcore Democrats. What I've found that independent voters want, in my family even, right, and I'm not, I don't pretend I'm an independent voter, but for independent voters, is they want politicians who are responsive to them, who will listen, and who will make a decision based on the evidence in front of them and what they're hearing. So on this issue, the public might lean left. On the issue, the public might lean right. And the legislature should be responsive to that. That's not the legislature we have today. We have a legislature that is hardcore partisan. The Republican majority is hardcore partisan. The Democratic minority 
is hardcore partisan. There are very, very few moderate legislators. There are very, very few legislators, if any, that are responsive to you as an independent. If you're not buying into their party politics, you're not relevant to the system at all today. And that's the reality of our political system. So I, I don't have any quarrel with what you're saying about like, let's think bigger, right? I would love to think bigger, and I think that having a big fight about like, let's change, there are states that have multi-member districts, there are states that are using ranked choice voting, those are really important reforms that will actually give power to the middle, and give power to compromise, and give power to community, um, and I would love to get there. I've got a very narrow mandate right now in the Fair Elections Project to try to solve the redistricting process in the current system. We're not going to change it right by 2022. We're going to have to redraw these maps in 2021. But I would love to join with you in that fight to make our entire system more responsive to all of the people of Wisconsin. So We're going to give one last question to George. Okay. And then we I, stack those chairs. I was just going to ask, is, is there a brief um, a, a sort of easy description of how Iowa does it? The brief description of how Iowa does it, like I should just offer that verbally in like one minute. So they have a, an independent legislative agency called the Legislative Services Agency, the LSA. In Wisconsin, the same agency is called the LRB, Legislative Reference Bureau. Legislators of both parties go to the LSA and say, here's what I want in a bill, write it for me. And they have nonpartisan staff who don't have an opinion themselves, but if a Republican legislator says draw it or write a bill that says this, they do that. If a Democratic legislator says write a bill, do that, they do that, right? And they're actually protected in the law from any partisan influence, right? So they, they can't be fired or hired basically only on partisan terms by one party or the other, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the bill, what an Iowa bill does, is it takes those nonpartisan staff attorneys, it requires them to have public hearings, it requires them to do this all very transparently, to take all this input from the citizens, and then to draw a map right, that can be evaluated by the public, by the media, by mathematicians, by political scientists, and say, is that a fair map or is that not a fair map? And then they have to put forward a map to the legislature, and the legislature has to vote it up or down without amendments. So the legislature can't manipulate the map in the political trade-off, the compromising process, right? They have to take that product that is the, the result of basically this people-driven process instead of a politician-driven process, right? And that's basically what it is. That's what we're asking them to do in Wisconsin as well. Uh, I know we have to stack our... chairs, but as we're doing that, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more, and I appreciate you having me. Well, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, good mm -hmm. hand around.